everybody welcome tonight to pick dr osborne's brain got a great show for you before we dive in as always let me know where you're chiming in from in the world so just say hello let me know where you're tuning in from you know our mission here at dr peter osborne and gluten free society is to reach 100 million people so help me know how far we're reaching by saying hello now tonight's show we're going to be talking all about what's commonly referred to as the skin, hair, and nail vitamin, biotin. Biotin, also known as vitamin B7, sometimes referred to as vitamin B8. Important that if you see vitamin B8, again, sometimes those are used interchangeably, but also sometimes referred to as vitamin H. Now, that H actually comes from two German words for skin and hair, and that's why this is oftentimes called the skin and hair vitamins, often even more so, the skin, hair, and nail vitamins. So fingernails, also very important uh, function of biotin, helps the skin and the hair grow, helps the nails grow. So we'll add the nails in as well. So biotin is part of the B complex. So if we're talking about, you know, where what its function is b complex vitamins anytime you hear that term b complex vitamin it's part of a family of b vitamins there's b1 b2 b3 b5 b6 b7 uh, b8 b9 and b12 and then there's some other nutrients that are like b vitamins that technically aren't b vitamins but those are oftentimes clumped together as what we refer to as the b complex vitamins themselves and biotin is one of these now the important thing to understand is that not just biotin but all b vitamins their primary function or one of their primary roles metabolically speaking is to drive the production of energy and this energy comes from the metabolism or the breakdown of your food so when you eat carbs when you eat fats when you eat proteins B vitamins help take those carbs, fats, and proteins and subsequently break them down into smaller segments and ultimately lead to the process of energy generation. And that energy is oftentimes referred to biochemically as ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And this is what our body uses as in, in a high energy bond or high level of energy is how we generate energy. So think of ATP, when you think of B vitamins, um, think of B vitamins as the necessary agents that can uncouple your food to generate energy. And think of this energy kind of as an analogy, the way you might think of money. You know, if you live in the civilized world, you use money to trade for things, right? You trade money for rent or, or, or for your where you live, how you buy gas, how you buy groceries, how you buy clothing, how you purchase things that you might need in this world. Well, your body generates its money, right, from the breakdown of your food to form the substance known as ATP. So anytime you come across this word, anytime, whether it's me or someone else talking about it, know that ATP is like the financial currency of molecular chemistry, of biochemistry inside your body. And without ATP, the buck stops. Everything fails to work properly. You've got to have money in the real world to function. You've got to have ATP in the biochemical world for your body to be able to function. And that's why the B-complex vitamins are so crucial and so critical. And that's why this should be primary curriculum that's taught in medical schools, even though it's not. It should be taught in medical schools because doctors should understand that when patients come to them with things like fatigue and hair loss or thinning hair or, rigid, or uh, brittle nails, nails that aren't growing properly or dry skin because the oils are not being properly produced on the skin to lubricate it. Like these are things that happen as a result okay, of biochemistry gone wrong. And if we're talking about, you know, biotin itself, let's switch slides. Let's talk about some of the symptoms caused by biotin deficiencies. So we're going to go down a little bit lower. There we go. So let's look at some of these symptoms. I'll put a slide up for you. So 
One of the most common symptoms is hair loss. This is where kind of biotin is its claim to fame is the skin, hair, and nail vitamin. So when you take higher doses of biotin, oftentimes leads to increased thickness of hair because biotin can play a role in keratin formation, which is the back, backbone or the back, uh, the backbone protein for hair and skin. So oftentimes people will take biotin. It's in a lot of hair care products. It's in a lot of hair care supplements, right? So we'll see people taking biotin to try to improve their hair growth. Um, so hair loss is kind of one of the major symptoms of biotin deficiency. But we've also got some other things that can happen. And one of the big ones is perioral dermatitis. And it's not even just perioral. What does that mean, perioral dermatitis? This means inflammation around the corners of the lips, so around the mouth. Uh, people will start to develop inflammation in bumpy-like skin, very, very common. Another symptom is what's known as seborrheic dermatitis. So this is kind of a generalized inflammation of the skin, okay? And oftentimes mistaken as, a, as an eczema and oftentimes mistaken as like a psoriatic type of rash and sometimes mistaken as an infection and it's you know again these things all look very very similar to the naked eye on the skin or can look very similar so you know you go to the dermatologist sometimes they'll give you the diagnosis of seborrheic dermatitis but how many times and raise your hands if this has happened right if you've gone to the di to the doctor and got a excuse me a diagnosis of seborrheic dermatitis if they ran and tested you for biotin deficiency it's super rare that that might happen it's actually so rare that i've yet to see in 20 years uh, a client coming into my office to see me who've had this diagnosis have their dermatologist actually run this test to look for biotin deficiency. So again, it's it's one of the symptoms, one of the hallmark symptoms that we want to look for. Um, so I mentioned hair loss before as well, but fatigue is another one. And fatigue is kind of a generalized symptom. So going back to what I was talking about a minute ago, biotin deficiency can cause fatigue because you need biotin to break down I didn't write it up here, but in order to break down carbs, in order to break down fats, and in order to break down proteins and amino acids, you need biotin. Uh, so it plays a role in all three macronutrient um, breakdowns in, in terms of generating energy and, 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 and driving energy production. So this is why it causes fatigue. Remember, if you can't make energy from the food that you eat, where are you going to get the energy from? And biotin deficiency can contribute to that, to that lack of energy. Now, other symptoms associated with biotin deficiency, myalgia or muscle pain is one of them. Nausea can be a symptom of biotin deficiency. Uh, ataxia or imbalanced gait. So starting to, you know, when you walk feeling somewhat dizzy, this can happen as a result. There are other forms of neuropathy. So neuropathy like pain neuropathies or numbness and tingling in the hands and the feet. But neuropathy is a common side effect of biotin deficiency. Depression is a common symptom of biotin deficiency as well. So we have a number of different things that can occur as a result of biotin deficiency, but this is kind of the short list of some of the most common things that are seen. So if you are suffering with any of these things, especially if you could check off multiples, right? Let's say you got hair loss, you got facial dermatitis, you've got chronic fatigue and your muscles hurt all the time and you're constantly upset to your stomach, like ask your doctor to run a test to measure to see whether or not you have a deficiency of biotin. Very, very simple, okay? So now let's talk about who might develop a biotin deficiency. That way you can match these symptoms to some of the potential reasons as to why biotin deficiency can happen. So if we can go to how biotin is absorbed, I'll throw a slide up for you, because if we, if we understand how biotin is absorbed, then we can understand a little bit better about whether or not you're at risk for developing a deficiency. So first and foremost, you need stomach acid to absorb biotin. So let's think about all the ways that stomach acid can be disrupted and let's uh and and let's go ahead and add those to the list of those who are at risk for the development of biotin deficiency number one if you 
have a diagnostic condition. If somebody, if your GI doctor's diagnosed you with achlorhydria or a lack of stomach acid or an absence of stomach acid production, this is a kind of a, a hallmark of somebody who might have a problem with biotin deficiency because the absorption of biotin requires acid. You need stomach acid. And so that means Tums and Rolaids and Nexium and Prilosec and Tagamet and all the different medicines that we know that you know, neutralize stomach acid or suppress the production of stomach acid could potentially contribute to an inability to properly absorb biotin. Now, most of biotin is absorbed in the small intestine. So it's broken down in your food through acid, but then when it hits the small intestine, it's taken up by the cells of the small intestine. So what might affect the small intestine that could contribute to a biotin deficiency? Well, we've got a number of different diseases of the small intestine. So if we think about this, you know, one of them is celiac disease, celiac, or uh, I'm not using these words interchangeably because celiac disease and gluten sensitivity are not the same thing. Everybody with celiac is gluten sensitive, but not everybody with gluten sensitivity develops celiac disease. But we do know that gluten sensitivity can lead to intestinal damage of the small intestine. And that inflammation of the small intestine can contribute to malabsorption because again, most of your biotin is absorbed by the small intestine. So one of the other things that we need functioning is the pancreas, so, because one of the other things that plays a role in, in biotin absorption is the pancreas. The pancreas produces a substance called biotinidase, which aids in biotin absorption. So without pancreatic, so if you've got like, maybe you've gone to the doctor and they told you you have pancreatitis, right? Or you've got pancreatic insufficiency problems. This might put you at risk, okay, for developing a biotin deficiency. If you've got an inflammatory bowel issue like celiac disease, but celiac is not the only one. Some people have Barrett's esophagitis. Some people have uh, inflammation in the stomach. Some people have inflammation in the small intestine uh, that can be caused by infections and uh, food allergens and a host of other issues that are not gluten related. Parasites can do this as well, parasitic infection. Um, and that can create small intestinal inflammation leading to, again, damage to the brush border. So part of where biotin is absorbed is by the brush border of your small intestine. So if you remember this, that celiac disease is hallmark. The symptoms are that the brush border of the small intestine is eroded, and that's what villus atrophy is. So there are other diseases and other things that can cause villus atrophy and erosion of the brush border. So we know that in some people, soy protein can do it. We know that parasite infection can contribute to brush border erosion. We know that corn can contribute to brush border erosion. So these are all potential possibilities. Again, that could contribute to a scenario that leads to your inability to properly absorb biotin. So again, you need stomach acid. It's absorbed in the small intestine, but it's also part of that absorption is, is the brush border doing its job. And part of that absorption is important that your pancreas is functioning to produce biotinidase, help you take that biotin up into the bloodstream directly. Now, biotin has a number of different target tissues that it will travel to. Your, your brain needs a lot of biotin, your liver needs a lot of biotin, your muscle needs a lot of biotin. Let's think about what biotin is for. It's for the breakdown of carbs, fats, and proteins. I already erased it, but it's for the breakdown of carbs, fats, and proteins. So uh, in, in terms of generating energy, those organs use more energy pound for pound than other organs do. So this is why it's a target tissue for lots of biotin. Your muscle, your brain, your liver use a lot of energy. Now, biotin also aids in building fat. So once it's absorbed, okay, we said energy earlier, but energy is one aspect. So energy is a process where we break down carbs, fats, and proteins to generate ATP, but we also use biotin to build fat. Um, it's particularly important for biotin to aid in the building of fat. So it helps to elongate long chain or longer chain fatty acids. This is very, very important that you understand that biotin is not just about breaking fat down. It's also about helping your body build fat. Remember what fats do we need to build? We need to build the oils that come out of our skin, the oils that secrete into our hair, the oils that secrete to our nails. Those are all important functions of biotin. We also need oil around every cell membrane. We need oil for the elongation of essential fatty acids 
uh, you know, your fatty acids, for example, your omega-3 fats, very, very critical, very important. And so you need biotin to aid in the processing of those. It also helps to stabilize genetic integrity. This is one of the newer, um, the newer discoveries around biotin. So genetic stability. There, we're going to learn more about this in the next probably 10 years or so as, as technology advances. But there's areas that are being recognized that biotin uh, is taken up into, and these areas are, are genetic areas called histones. And so the, the suspicion is that biotin plays a role in stabilizing your genome or stabilizing your genetic material and your chromatin. And this is a very, very important part of cellular metabolism and cellular replication. So less is known about the actual, the actual action of what biotin actually does here, but we, we believe very strongly that this is part of what biotin does. We've actually isolated biotin being uptaken by histones. So genetic st stability, again, this is relatively new in literature and, and, in, and in research. So most people will talk about its function in hair, its function in nails, its function in energy and building of fats, but you'll, you'll very rarely hear the genetic issue coming up as far as what biotin does. So let's talk, uh, let's talk next a little bit about what causes biotin deficiency outside of things that impact or affect your absorption. So we, we mentioned earlier that um, inflammatory bowel disease is going to obviously it's going to affect your ability to absorb biotin but are there other things that can contribute to biotin deficiency that you know that you should be aware of so there are a number of things in the research that we know that that can contribute to biotin deficiency and one of them is alcohol So alcohol is a big factor. And alcohol, let's talk about that for a minute because a lot of people just, you know, they just drink and it's a socially accepted paradigm that, you know, drinking is, is safe and, and, and uh, relatively harmless. But, you know, here's the thing. It depends on the quantity of alcohol that we we're discussing because a lot of people will tell you that a glass of wine every night is healthy, right? Remember that it's, it's not alcohol in kind of small doses incrementally here or there, but it's consistent use of alcohol over time that acts as a, as a damaging agent to your liver, but also acts as a diuretic in many ways causes the depletion of B vitamins. And a lot of your B vitamin deficiency diseases are known to be caused, especially in people who are alcoholics. Now, how do we define an alcoholic? Because some people are functional alcoholics. I mean, I've run into people that are drinking every night and they still get up, go to work, they're able to take care of their responsibilities. I would call that functional alcoholism, meaning they're not drunks, right? But you got to be real careful because the long-term exposure to alcohol consistently over time is definitely going to contribute to a biotin deficiency. So a glass of wine a night, as an example, in my opinion, is too much. Uh, if you're talking about alcohol consumption, look at it as a once a week and not, not like don't drink seven drinks to make up for the other six nights, but, but you know, a glass on a weekend or a glass on a weeknight, but, you know, let, keeping it in, in directly and very much in moderation. Um, additionally, I mentioned this before, reduction in stomach acid. And again, think about this from the perspective of medications that you might be taking to, to suppress gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD if you've been diagnosed with GERD and you're on like a Prilosec or a Tagamet or one of these other over-the-counter acid-reducing medications. Look, you're running the risk of increasing your risk of biotin deficiency by suppressing your capacity to generate effectively stomach acid. Smoking is another one. So smoking can cause biotin deficiency. There have been a number of studies that show the correlation between biotin levels in the, in the blood and smokers. So smoking is another one. Hopefully, most of you listening to this show, if you're tuning in to me, you, you probably already know that it's not a newsflash that smoking is not healthy, right? So um, if you're one that, you know, found, find yourself addicted, you know, this might be something you go back to your doctor and say, look, I'm trying to quit, but test my levels. I want to make sure I'm not creating more problems. Pregnancy, and although pregnancy is not, you know, it's not a condition per se, it's a condition, right, of giving, of getting ready to give birth, but pregnancy 
um, has been linked as well. Pregnancy and breastfeeding have been linked to biotin to increasing biotin utilization and, and biotin deficiency or the potential for biotin deficiency. So pregnant women, in my opinion, should be tested. And if you're pregnant, those of you that are listening, maybe you're not pregnant, but maybe you know someone who is, Look, it's very, very important and it's very critical that anyone who is pregnant has their nutritional status checked during the pregnancy and then during breastfeeding because you're eating for two and it's very, very easy to develop nutritional deficit during this time frame. It's, it's a very, very common phenomenon. As a matter of fact, some of the lab testing that, that I run consistently on people and the, the most deficient individuals I've ever seen clinically are generally either pregnant or breastfeeding women. So realize that that um, very, very smart idea to ask your OB-GYN to run a full nutritional workup on you post or prepartum, postpartum, breastfeeding, et cetera. You wanna know so that you can make an accommodation or an adjustment in what you're taking because a prenatal doesn't cut the mustard for what's actually necessary in most cases. A prenatal is gonna usually be pretty weak in a lot of your different nutrients. It's gonna be low in minerals and it's gonna be marginally high in some of the B vitamins, but it's not really gonna be therapeutic if you have major deficiencies. And then of course, there are other things that are, are notorious for creating uh, biotin deficiency. And one of those is, is, um, is, is if you've ever been in the hospital and they had to IV your nutrition, so they had to direct your nutrition around your GI tract. It's a very, very common cause or can be a cause of biotin deficiency, as well as if you've had a stomach surgery where you've had like a bypass, like a ruin Y, where you're bypassing the stomach acid altogether through a surgical procedure, like that's a common contributing factor or an increased risk for developing biotin deficiency. So. Uh, stomach surgeries, bypass, very common surgery being done nowadays for people who want to lose weight, but again, increasing that risk of developing a deficiency. Another one that is not talked about very commonly is, we'll draw a number five down here, is egg whites. Um, if you grew up when I did, you remember watching Rocky Balboa suck down the eggs, the raw egg shakes, right? And there's a protein in egg whites and in, in it's in only really found to a great degree in raw egg whites called avidin, A-V-I-D-I-N. And that protein binds biotin. It prevents you from absorbing it. So it makes the biotin in the egg really hard to absorb. So if you're doing a lot of raw egg whites, this could, could potentiate a biotin deficiency. Now, if you're cooking the egg thoroughly, um, you don't have to worry about it because when you cook the egg, the avidin, the protein that binds biotin is denatured. And so no, it allows that biotin to be freed up. So again, raw egg whites, but not cooked egg whites can create a problem with biotin. Now, I don't suspect that probably today's age that too many of you are probably doing a ton of raw egg whites, but this was a super popular nutritional um, shake, so to speak, in the, in the 1980s. And so it's something that's kind of passed out of favor, but some of you might be doing it, so I thought I would mention it. So again, raw egg whites. There's also inborn errors of metabolism that can occur with, with as a creator of biotin deficiency, but these are quite rare. I and mean, the incidence of these is like one in 130,000 or so. So it's not a super common thing at all. And it's usually caught very, very early in infancy. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about inborn errors of metabolism. Next, I wanna to go to some of the medications that actually can deplete biotin because a lot of you might be taking medications. So let's, let's pull up that slide on medicines that deplete biotin. So I mentioned already the stomach acid suppressing drugs can do it. So things that block stomach acid very commonly can cause uh, the increased risk for developing of a biotin defi deficiency, but then there are also seizure medications. So if you have a diagnosis of epilepsy, there's some research studies that show that anti-epileptic seizure medications actually deplete biotin as well. And remember what I said earlier, ataxia, neuropathy, depression, these are all neurological symptoms of biotin deficiency. So if you're taking a seizure medication and you start to develop these symptoms, you might start suspecting biotin um, as a potential culprit in that process. So, so, you know, again, be aware that if you 
are taking epileptic medication that you know that those drugs can cause biotin deficiency directly and ask your doctor to monitor your levels. I would say check, have your levels checked about every six months and just make sure you don't develop a problem. Now, one of the other medications that's notorious for causing biotin deficiency is the antibiotic. And here's why. The good thing about biotin, as, as, as with a few of the other B vitamins, is that you actually can make it. About 50% of your daily biotin is produced by your GI tract. It's produced by your microbiotic flora. So you, your bacteria that live inside of you make half of the biotin that you need. And so remember, good bacteria make biotin. And that biotin can be absorbed by your GI tract. And, and so that's a good thing, right? About 50% of our daily need. And so what do antibiotics do? Antibiotics wipe out good bacteria. And so I'm not talking about a person who maybe had a dose of antibiotics when they were two once because they had a major infection and that they have to be worried about, you know, they're 35 today and they have to be worried about biotin deficiency today. I'm talking about people that go on antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic. So if you were the, the kid with chronic recurring ear infections repetitively and your mom took you every two weeks to the doctor and you were on an antibiotic six times a year, or maybe you're an adult and you know, you, you've you been suffering with chronic inflammatory bowel disease that was caused by something like Clostridium difficile, a common infection that leads to ulcerative colitis. Um, look, these are, these are, those are the people who are at greatest risk is those of you who have taken multiple rounds of antibiotics repetitively over and over and over again. Remember, antibiotics are very serious medications and shouldn't be used lightly. In my opinion, they shouldn't really be used without a culture, meaning if the doctor can't culture the bacteria and identify that you actually have a bacterial infection, then rethinking the antibiotic is probably a good idea. Most people aren't in a life-threatening situation when they take an antibiotic. Most people are taking their kids to the pediatrician or going to the general doctor and you know, they're being told they have something like strep or staph, you know, not necessarily life-threatening infections, but the antibiotics are being handed out like candy to a lot of people. And again, biotin, 50% of your biotin is produced by your good bacteria. Now, we talked about vitamin K a few weeks ago, and I said that about 50, 60% of your vitamin K need comes from your good bacteria as well. So you can add vitamin K to that list if you don't remember us having that conversation. So those are the big ones. So again, the antibiotics, the antacids, the anti-epileptic or seizure medications, and then the gastric bypass as a, as a, even though it's not a medication per se, it's a medical procedure that can increase your risk for the development of a biotin deficiency. Okay, let's make a little bit of room on the board here. So beyond these things, let's talk a little bit about food. How can you get biotin in what you eat? What are the food sources that are gonna help you make sure that you're getting biotin on a daily basis? Now, I hinted at one earlier, probably one of the richest sources of biotin is the incredible edible egg. And uh, again, just not the Rocky Balboa style, not the shake that you down with the egg whites, but the cooked egg, um, egg is, the richest source of dietary biotin that you can get. So foods, we got the egg. Number two is the liver. The liver is a great source of biotin, as, as it is for so many other vitamins as well. The liver is a source of pretty much all of the B vitamins. And uh, the, the, you know, my old biochemistry professor in graduate school used to say the liver is the giver, and it means the liver stores a lot of these nutrients so that it can redistribute them into the body as they're needed. And so when you eat animal liver, for example, it's a great source because just like in humans, the animals, their liver is a storage facility for excellent nutrients as well. Um, mushrooms, another great source of biotin. A lot of medicinal properties with mushrooms as well. They help support immune function and in some cases help the immune system work better. You've got spinach as a good source of biotin. So if you're a vegetarian or you're more of a plant-based type of person, you've got instead of eggs and liver, you've got mushroom, you've got spinach that you can also consume. There's also carrots, tomatoes um, are great sources. And I'm listing these two folks. I'm listing these 
in order of greatest to least. So um, this is quantity, kind of pound for pound. Think about these as their their richness in biotin and then beef. And we're talking about red meat here, beef at number seven, coming into the number seven spot. And then the last one on this list of foods rich in biotin is lettuce. So if you're looking for food sources, you know, jump in, dive in uh, to any of these things. Again, minus the ones you might potentially be allergic to. So if you've worked with a functional medicine doctor um, and, and had food allergy testing, obviously um, avoid what you're, what you're reactive to. But these are great sources and there's a variety of, of, uh, of different things here on this list, whether you're plant-based or whether you're not. Carniv there's diets, there's plant-based, there's vegan, there's carnivores out there. So it doesn't matter where you are, you can get biotin. You just have to look for it in the right places. So let's talk a little bit next. Uh, there are a couple of different studies that have started to come out on people actually, really more specifically researchers looking at treating certain diseases using biotin. And so there are two areas of research that we've seen where, where there has been some impactful benefit. And one of them is in multiple sclerosis. So I want to be clear, these research studies are far from like definitive, okay? But multiple sclerosis, some studies show that biotin helps to reduce some of the symptom progression in multiple sclerosis. So some of the neurological symptoms, the neuropathy, the ataxia, the depressions, that biotin can actually be helpful in that regard uh, in patients with multiple sclerosis. Another type of medical condition that biotin has been shown to help with is the diabetes. Uh, and we're talking about, in this case, we're talking about type two. We're not talking about insulin dependent diabetes. We're talking about diabetes type two, uh, which is adult onset typically, or, or we could say today, teenage onset, because so many younger kids are developing lifestyle diabetes, food choice diabetes, uh, as I like to call it, but there's some research now coming out that says that blood sugars can be uh, helped or, or you can get a little bit better regulation by using higher doses of biotin. Now, I don't recommend either one of these two things, and let me explain why. Um, we're talking about, first of all, these, the research on this is really quite preliminary, but second of all, there's something called green medicine and there's something called functional medicine. What is green medicine? Green medicine is the art, science, and practice of using natural agents instead of drugs to address the symptoms uh, that somebody might have. So if we use green medicine, it's a natural approach to symptom control. And in my opinion, although it's less dangerous than medicine in terms of side effects and risk, it's still a bad idea to isolate and use green medicine instead of regular medicine. I prefer functional medicine, and here's why. Functional medicine looks for the origin, looks at the origin of why the symptoms are there, okay? And then helps you to address the origin of the problem. If we use green medicine, or use a natural agent to get better outcomes in terms of symptoms in diseases like this, we're still not ascertaining the reason why the disease exists. And that's why. Again, it's not that you couldn't use biotin or, or uh, a biotin for MS or diabetes, but again, if it, it does help with your symptoms, it's still, you're not, you're not, most people don't develop a multiple sclerotic condition or diabetic condition because of a biotin deficiency. That's just not generally the way biotin deficiency manifests. So using high doses of any nutrients to overcome symptoms is the practice of green medicine. And green medicine is still suppressing symptoms, albeit with natural items instead of drugs. And that is not the core goal. Remember, the core goal is individual freedom of symptoms through the freedom of expression of changing, changes in diet and lifestyle, freeing your body to function and heal naturally through changes in behavior is the best thing that you can do. Taking high doses of nutrients, hoping that they'll help your symptoms is not necessarily the best thing that you can do. So um, again, there is research that shows benefit here, but I would say proceed in, the, in those directions with caution. 
because it's a form of green medicine. And if you really want to find out why the disease exists, you really want to dive in deeper than just symptomatic control. So all that being said, let's open the floor. Uh, actually, let's cover one more area because I can already hear the questions coming in. Dr. Osborne, if I took biotin, how much can I take? What's the safe quantity? Um, is, is there a particular type of biotin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So biotin, is it safe to take? It is safe. Are there any known toxicity levels? No. And research has, has shown that up to five um, milligrams or 5,000 micrograms per day for as long as two years was on, did not produce any side effects or toxic symptoms. And so some of you may say, well, if it doesn't produce any toxicity, why couldn't I use it here? Again, it's not that I'm worried about the biotin doing damage. I'm worried about the biotin masking the deeper root of your problem. And then you, you being basically, you being happy to just continue to use that without making diet and lifestyle changes to correct the actual underlying reason why the disease exists. So biotin does not have a known, any known toxicity. Now that being said, there's an intelligent uh, there's an intelligent approach to this too, which is anything in high enough quantities for a long enough period of time can become toxic. And that includes uh, biotin. And we just don't have any research that shows what level that is. So what we do know is that five milligrams taken uh, for two years daily did not show any toxic side effects. So that being said, what's the daily requirement for biotin? If we now, now again, if we're looking at daily requirements, it's 30 to, a, 30 to 100 micrograms per day, which is a lot lower than 5,000 micrograms for two years, right? So daily requirement is this. Now, here's the thing about daily requirements. Daily requirements are designed and they're based on how to overcome disease. So if somebody has the disease state of biotin deficiency, it requires 30 to 100 micrograms to get them out of the, the bulk of symptoms, of aggressive symptoms uh, being caused by that disease, but there's an upper range and there's an optimal level. And so that's where the argument in science is, is that some people will say, well, if the daily range is 30 to hundred, why would you ever take 5,000 or more than 5,000? Uh, and the reason is, is because this is the amount that's designed to keep a person out of a disease state, but there are subclinical disease states or subclinical symptoms that can begin to set in. And so this is the, again, the area, the gray area where because doctors don't ever test it, we really don't have enough data overall to say that, that a lot of people that develop these conditions are not actually in effect biotin deficient. So again, unless your doctor's just checking your nutritional status on a regular basis, but again, biotin really safe to take in higher doses as far as the research has shown to date. So, all right, now let's dive into some of the questions uh, that you guys have here. Uh, let's see. Does gabapentin suppress biotin? That was one of the questions coming in from, uh, let's see, Vicky. As far as we know, no. Um, there's no research that shows that gabapentin suppresses biotin. Now, on this note, gabapentin shuts down the GI tract. And one of the biggest side effects of gabapentin is, is, um, is it slows down uh, motility of the gut. And in which case, it can lead to a whole host of different types of problems. So, I would say from a gabapentin perspective, no, sir, no research showing biotin deficiency per se, but yes, definitely affects the, the GI tract. Okay, let's see here. I mean, we got people t tuning in from all over New York and Wisconsin, the Ozarks, London, England. Thanks for chiming in, guys. You know, that makes my day when you let me know where you're from. Uh, let's see. Vicky wanted to know what kind of liver or in what mushrooms? Well, pretty much most, most varieties of mushrooms are rich in biotin. As far as what type of liver, beef liver, chicken liver, lamb liver, all are gonna contain high levels of biotin. Um, so you could choose any one of those. Uh, let's see, can too much biotin cause panic attacks? David wants to know. Haven't ever seen that. And I've used, you know, very regularly in people up to 16,000 micrograms to correct deficiency and not yet seen anyone suffering from a panic attack. But, you know, I would say this, if you're taking higher doses of biotin and you're having panic attacks. And when you stop taking it, if your panic attacks go away, that, you know, the proof is so to speak in the proverbial pudding. Um, but no, it's not a, it's not a common side effect that I can say I've, I've seen in people. 
Let's see, does Tegretol cause low biotin? Not to my knowledge, another one that, that I, can't, I can't say for certain. That's one that uh, has been shown in, in medical research to cause uh, biotin loss. Does zinc deficiency affect biotin absorption? I mean, it can. I, you know, I have to understand that zinc is so integral, Suzanne, for, for gut function and for gut health. Um, you need zinc to make the finger proteins in the, in the GI tract that are important for digestive enzyme production in the GI tract. So zinc is a very important nutrient, not only to seal the gut, but also in digestive enzyme production. Um, let's see, Chris wants to know, are there any synergistic vitamins to antagonists? Not sure I understand your question. Maybe reword it for me. If you're talking about, are there other, B, are there other nutrients that work synergistically with biotin? Absolutely there are. It's called the B vitamin complex for a reason, because all the B vitamins when together will work better than when in singular high doses. Oh, I love this one. Heather says, "Will uh, I keep reading how biotin can affect thyroid blood work results. Yeah, so if you're taking high doses of biotin, it can give you a misinterpreted reading of your thyroid result. That is absolutely true. So again, if you're taking biotin on your own with in your you know your endocrinologist who's prescribing your thyroid medication doesn't know, you make sure that they do know so they can uh, monitor your dose accurately and get you an accurate dose without without that misrepresentation of reading. Uh, let's see. Keep going. Okay, let's go to, does biotin help with a yeast overgrowth? Um, I would say not so much. Um, you know, what helps with a yeast overgrowth is they're, they're really, there are about three different like key core things that need to be done for yeast overgrowth. And one of them is to starve the yeast. And the way we starve yeast is number one, no, absolutely zero alcohol. You're not going to get rid of a yeast overgrowth as long as you're drinking any form of alcohol. Number two, you have to starve yeast out. Yeast thrive on fermentable carbs. And so you want low ferm. I, I, I use, I put people on what's called low fermentation diet, where we're giving them low levels of carbohydrate that are fermentable so that we don't allow the, the feeding of the yeast. And so you want to starve the yeast, right? And so no alcohol and then no, no really heavily fermented carbs or sugars. Uh, uh, beyond that, you need to create competition for yeast. And generally speaking, what that means is making sure that you have a healthy microbiome or a good population of healthy bacteria because bacteria and yeast kind of compete against each other. Remember how we discovered antibiotics was through a form of mold, right? Penicillin mold created a substance that would basically kill bacteria. It's because these two combat with each other. They kind of compete for the same resources in your GI tract. So if you have a healthy level of healthy bacteria, it naturally is a, is a barrier for yeast overgrowing. So probiotics for some people works really well in that regard. I generally, if I, if I, find somebody with a yeast overgrowth. I'm also testing their microbiome to make sure that, that we know, you know what probiotics to use and how much to use. Additionally, um, flushing them out. Um, so, so yeast can be flushed out. There are a number of different protocols that can help with that. Um, my advice though, if you're gonna do something like that, get with a good doc and, and do it under guidance. So you know the big things that you can do for yeast is again, um, create competition for it, don't feed it, uh, and and uh, potentially um, there are many antifungals naturally that can be taken through food. Things like garlic and oregano are great natural antifungals. Um, let's see. Donna says, I mentioned seizures. My friend had breast cancer and after the chemo and taking tamoxifen, she now has seizures. Doesn't surprise me. Do any of these drugs cause biotin deficiency or is it most likely caused by something else? I'm sure there are many possibilities. A lot of possibilities, but generally with chemo, and tamoxifen. So chemo is going to create or deplete B vitamins in general, but particularly vitamin B12 and folate, which is, remember B12 and folate are necessary to produce 
uh, myelin. They're also necessary to form acetylcholine, serotonin, and dopamine. So when you deplete those B vitamins, you actually can create neurotransmitter imbalances that could potentially potentiate seizures. We know B12 deficiency can do it. We know folate deficiency can do it. So that would be where I would uh, tell your friend to ask their doctor to look first. Uh, and then tamoxifen, that's another one. I know a lot of ladies are taking tamoxifen after the breast cancer as a, as a, as a tool to reduce their risk. And they're, generally, they're told to take it for anywhere from three to five years after the chemotherapy. Um, look, the fact of the matter is tamoxifen, there's some research now coming out that shows that tamoxifen induces autoimmune disease. So, you, you know, again, I'm not telling you not to take your tamoxifen if it was prescribed, but you certainly should have a conversation with the prescribing doctor about that risk. Um, because it's, um, it's a serious risk. Let's see here. Does biotin play a role with oxalate, uh, oxalate metabolism? Yes. Uh, acetooxalates and some of the others, it, it can. Uh, David wants to know, is biotin a fat soluble vitamin? No, biotin is water soluble as are all B vitamins in their natural forms. How is biotin affected by cooking? Generally speaking, um, you get some loss of activity in biotin, but it's relatively heat stable. So not, not terribly so uh, when you cook it. And a lot of, there's a lot of raw foodies out there that say, oh, the vitamins are destroyed by heat. And that's not true 100%. There are certain vitamins that are, that are not as heat stable, but biotin is relatively heat stable. What's the best test for biotin and what is an optimum level? Well, the best test for biotin is intracellular analysis. Um, looking inside the, the cells themselves to see whether or not they're storehousing adequate biotin. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the question about biotin and thyroid tests coming up again. Yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to before you get your thyroid testing done to get off of your biotin for several days, maybe even a week or so, so that, uh, remember, it's water-soluble. It has a relatively short half-life, and you'll knock it down just by discontinuing it for a week enough that it shouldn't affect your thyroid result. Okay, let's see. So Acetyl wants to know, any role in nerve repair with vitamin B7? Of course. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very crucial for fat metabolism. Remember, biotin builds and breaks down fat. And what is myelin produced from? Myelin is the fatty substrate that surrounds or insulates nerves. Um, and so, so biotin plays a major role. That's why it can create, deficiency can create ataxia and nausea, but a major role in nerve function as a result of fat, fat metabolism. Uh, can biotin be taken at bedtime without sleep interruption? Yeah, it's not generally, biotin's not one of those like B12, for example, um, or B1 or B2. Those ones can tend to like bump up your energy. Um, and taking them before bedtime or really even before 4 p.m. Can, can make it harder to get some good restful sleep. So, but biotin doesn't tend to do that. So it's one that generally is taken well, um, well in the evening time without that bump. Let's see. So somebody's asking about IV biotin. And you can do, I mean, get with, your, get with a, a local doctor who does IV infusions and you can ask about it. Generally, biotin is not used in super high amounts unless you're on specific neurological protocols. Um, Wanda wants to know, when you use a B-complex vitamin, aren't the doses of each much less than what you could take individually? Yeah, generally they are, depending on the B-complex. Um, you know, most B-complexes, you know, focus on like 50 milligram doses of a lot of the B vitamins or, or 20 or 30 milligram doses. But... Um, yeah, I mean, especially as it relates to biotin, most B complexes are relatively low dose biotin um, and they don't hit the uh, super mega therapeutic ranges. Gabriella wants to know my vitamin D is 30. Does it mean I'm at risk of having biotin deficiency? No, your vitamin D and your biotin are, are not related directly. There's not like a causal relationship between vitamin D deficiency. And, uh, and biotin deficiency. So your vitamin D is low. You need to probably get more sunshine and possibly supplement, but, um, but it necessar doesn't necessarily cause biotin deficiency. Can H. pylori infection affect B vitamins? It absolutely can, Wendy. H. pylori damages the gastric cells. So we think about H. pylori and its effect. It damages parietal cells in the stomach. Parietal cells um, secrete intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid 
And when you lower acid, remember what we said about biotin a minute ago, achlorhydria or low stomach acid can contribute to biotin deficiency, but there are other B vitamins that also require um, acid to be properly absorbed. And so again, if H. pylori is damaging those stomach cells and reducing their capacity to produce properly, then yeah, that absolutely can. Uh, Linda wants to know, if you take B12, can you also take a B complex or will that overdose the B12? It's an individual basis, Linda. I mean, because um, it's such a broad question. I mean, overdosing with B vitamins is kind of a hard thing to do. That doesn't mean it can't be done, but they're relatively safe even at higher doses. There aren't a lot of, I mean, outside of vitamin B6, vitamin B6 does have some toxicology data, meaning that people can become toxic in vitamin B6. It's one of the few that actually can create a neuropathy type of symptom if taken in too high of doses. But the other ones are so safe that there's generally a relatively no to low toxicity on using them. But again, that doesn't mean you as an individual might not have a reaction. I do see some people that, that react to them regardless. Um, so it's just one of those things I'd say, if you're taking high doses or trying to take multiple things, you get with your, get with your doc and really um, maybe first get a test that tells you whether or not you even need those things. Wendy wants to know, does pastured liver contain biotin? Yes, it does. Uh, and the other bees. Yes, it does. So liver, we're talking about pasture fed or, or grazed animals. Yes, contain lots of biotin. Again, liver is the number two kind of food resource for biotin in the diet. Leaky gut. Does having leaky gut increase the risk of biotin deficiency? Um, yes, it can, but it also, I mean, a lot of the, again, leaky gut can be caused by a number of different things. And so generally if the damage is great enough, uh, and the damage is also occurring to the brush border, then yes, you can increase the risk for the development, development of a biotin deficiency. Okay. Let's see. Can low biotin cause psoriasis? Not so much psoriasis. Psoriasis is an autoimmune condition. I mean, generally speaking, psoriasis is an autoimmune reaction in the skin, and there are four predominant triggers for autoimmunity. And that, you know, if you haven't heard me talk before, you can go check out the Autoimmune Revolution, uh, autoimmunerevolution.org, and in a, I, I give about a two and a half hour presentation on autoimmune disease and, and the triggers for autoimmune disease. But psoriasis, very simply put, is an autoimmune condition that has Generally, in my experience, four different categorical triggers being uh, nutritional deficiencies can be one of them, and that includes, you know, biotin, but also um, food as a trigger, chemical exposures as a trigger, and microbial imbalance is also a trigger. Is uh, Marie wants to know is taking biotin supplements counterproductive for Hashimoto sufferers? No, it's not. It's not counterproductive at all. Uh, again, it can just cause some misleading lab interpretation, but it's not counterproductive, just like iodine, iodine, somebody with an iodine deficiency um, who doesn't have Hashimoto's or doesn't have positive antibodies, they can still take iodine. It's not contraindicated for them to take iodine for their thyroid function. Uh, but remember that higher doses of iodine actually can cause a false elevation in TSH. So it's kind of like that. You, you want to just be careful if you're taking high levels of micronutrients that you let your doc know who's monitoring that. And that way they can take that into account or have you fast from your nutritional supplementation before you actually do the lab work. Does biotin have anything to do with ITP? ITP is idiopathic thrombocyto uh, purpura, which is a form of platelet, uh, platelet disorder. Um, not to my knowledge. I haven't seen any research that correlates or connects the two. Um, doesn't mean we might not see it in the future. Um, since surgery in January, Shelly wants to know, how can you keep from getting a rash by the incision? You know, if you're getting a consistent rash, you'd have it looked at. I mean, it, you know, you want to be very careful if the, if the incision site is not really cleaning up and you're, and you're having a consistent rash, there may be an infection. So I would first and foremost, go make sure you have it looked at and, and make sure you have it tested, possibly even cultured to make sure there's not an infection because that could turn into a nasty ordeal. Um, Let's see here. JJ says, I use a liquid methyl B complex and also add some extra niacin, biotin, and B12. Does that sound okay? I'd be very cautious about the liquid methyl B12s. The ones that I've ever looked at, and I've looked at hundreds of different formulations, generally tend to have 
corn derivatives in them. So if you're following the no grain, no pain diet and the no grain, no pain lifestyle, that's be a bad idea. To my knowledge, uh, my company is the only company in the world that makes a true grain-free, non-corn derivative form of methylcobalamin. Ours is a lozenge and it's named the very same thing. Methylcobalamin is what it's called. Um, let's see here. Donna said, I had B6 toxicity years ago, which caused neuropathy, so I can confirm that. Thanks for chiming in, Donna. Yeah, I mean, B6 is one of the few that can, one of the few B vitamins that can cause a toxicity. All my B tests are high. Do I still need to take them? If you're talking about your lab tests, your serum lab tests, it depends. If, you, if your doctor checked your serum levels of B vitamins, know that that's not a real accurate representation or, uh, or accurate in terms of knowing whether or not your body is deficient. Um, so, so, you know, again, I would, I would say if, if ask for the right test, intracellular, not serum levels. Serum levels can, can look high after you take a supplement. You could pop a B12 right now, go take your beer, your serum levels, and they're going to come back artificially high. So, um, so anyway, Hopefully you take that to heart. Chris says, please, please make an audible version of my book. I have an audible version, Chris. Um, head on over to Amazon. There's an audible version. There's also one on CD. So you can grab it either way. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's uh, Simon & Schuster Touchstone. So just look up No Grain, No Pain when you go to the audible store. You should be able to pull it right up. Lickety split. Okay. Are there any blood tests that biotin? So, so we mentioned that already, Cheryl. Are, yes, thyroid blood thyroid tests uh, can come back uh, mixed and skewed as a result of high dose biotin. Um, is low biotin a culprit of depression or mood disorder? It can be, David. Um, biotin deficiency can cause depression. Again, um, as we talked about earlier, neuropathy, depression, ataxia, all potential symptoms of biotin deficiency. Gabriella says, no grain, no pain is awesome. Uh, thanks, Gabriella. I really, really appreciate it. I, that was two years. Actually, it was more like 18 years of work that went into the book experience and everything, but two years to write. So I appreciate your kind words. Okay. Somebody says, I, my mom bought me that book. I need to read it. Yeah, I agree, Shelly. Go read it. Because if you show up every Monday night for the show, um, and you have kind of the knowledge that's in no grain, no pain, and then you show up for the show, you're going to take a whole lot more out of the show. You're going to take away a whole lot more information. It's going to be a lot easier to understand uh, if you have no grain, no pain. It's kind of your background of information to start with. All right. It looks like we're low on time, folks. We are right up at the hour. I want to make sure that any of you listening tonight, if this is your first time on the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show, come back and visit us again next Monday night. Also, make sure if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. And once you hit subscribe, hit the bell to get notifications. We'll send you a notification every time we're getting ready to go live. That way you never miss a show, never miss an episode. You also want you to subscribe. We'll, we'll, uh, you'll be notified when new videos are up. We put out about seven to 10 videos a week. And so I want to make sure you get access to all the information that I'm trying to put out there. And if you are so inclined, please type in your feed right now, hashtag save 100 million lives, not a million lives, a hundred million lives. This is our goal. This is what we're trying to accomplish and achieve. And I really, really need your help in paying this knowledge forward to people who maybe aren't tuning in yet that need to find the show. Very important that we spread this message of light and hope and knowledge so that people can go demand the best from their doctors and have intelligent conversations with them or find doctors who are willing to have those intelligent conversations. Additionally, come visit the new Gluten-Free Society. That's glutenfreesociety.org. We've just released a new update on the site. There's a lot of new, very robust features that you're going to find very helpful, including a new interactive cookbook and a new video section where you can access a lot of our archives and a lot of our shows, uh, as well as a community you can come be a part of and join. And if you're looking for more help going gluten-free, sign up for our newsletter. It's the largest gluten-free newsletter in the world with over 250,000 subscribers. We are here to support you. We're here to serve you. So make sure you take advantage of all these wonderful free resources that my team and I have put together for you. 
and make sure you pay it forward. The only way that we can afford to continue to do this is if you help us spread that message. So until next week, wishing you excellent health. This is Dr. Osborne. Good night. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.